Hasbinah bin Ibrahim, Deputy Dean, Postgraduate and Responsible Research, Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman, Kuliya of Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Human Sciences. And our distinguished speaker, uh, Ustad Tahseen and Khan, who is a lecturer of Islamic theology, the Salam Seminary, Chicago, USA. And Assistant Professor Dr. Husseini bin Jami, who is the Assistant Professor of the Department of Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Studies, and Haskell Villages. Respected colleagues, um, academic and administrative members, and beloved students, dear brothers and sisters, we would like to welcome you all to today's session entitled Contemporary Issues Related to the Origin and Evolution of Men and Islamic Discourse. So let's start today's session with the recitation of the Umbal Kitab al Fatiha. Amin Ya Rabbul Alameen. Dear brothers and sisters, uh, let's not forget our brothers and sisters in Palestine, in Gaza and around the world who are struggling for the Islam, for Muslims and Muslims for their lands. Amin Ya Rabbul Alameen. So let's begin with the uh, welcoming remarks. And I have the pleasure to invite Professor Dr. Shukran bin Abdul Rahman, Dean Ahas, Kulia of Islamic Degree Knowledge and Human Sciences, to deliver his welcoming address. Thank you very much, Dr. Mubin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very pleasant afternoon to all of you. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa ala ashrafil anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Respected Associate Professor Dr. Asina Ibrahim, Deputy Dean of Postgraduate and Responsible Research, Dr. Mughedin, Ahmad Mughedin, the Coordinator for uh, Islamization of Knowledge, um, academic members, students, brothers and sisters, and most importantly, our guest speaker for today's session, Mr. Tahseen and Khan, a lecturer in um, Islamic theology from Darussalam Seminary in the United States of America. Alhamdulillah, we are very pleased and delighted to have you okay, in-house today. And this, uh, I think, is very much related to our initiative now, of uh, enhancing our community engagement, right? So our community engagement activities entail our engagement with uh, at least four types of community. And one of them is a uh, learned community, the learned community, the learned scholar from local, regional, and international. So you are very, uh, we are very lucky to have you today because it supports our agenda of uh, internet, internet, internationalizing our academic activities, especially in teaching and learning activities. And I think after this, the points that you share with us also contribute to our other activities, research and maybe publication as well, right? I think uh, all of us are aware that uh, our ethos or our philosophy of education in IIUM, especially in Ahasya DHS, are uh, anchoring on four important pillars. The first one is systemization, second one is uh, integration, then um, relevantization, and the fourth one is uh, comprehensive excellences in whatever we do here. What we do here, we do research, we do uh, publication, we do consultancy, we do innovation, we also do publication. And we want to be uh, a referral center in the area that we do here. And uh, domain of knowledge that we house, that we host in this school year are at least 10 or 11, right? Uh, from 
uh, psychology, sociology, communication, history, civilization, political science, the Quran, Sunnah studies, uh, fiqh and usul fiqh, usul uh, din and comparative religion, and halal as well. Right. So these are the areas that we study here, and we do not want to say that we have two divisions. But we don't have two divisions that like one RK, one HS. That everything is of human sciences and Islamic revealed knowledge in that sense. Right, and we are now very seriously looking into what we are offering our students, especially in understanding human. Right, so the human sciences notion that we are advocating, that we are generating knowledge and disseminating that, it have to be always what we call that revisited. And then your presence here will be of help here, you know, of help to our academics and students here to know the origin of human and how. Do the knowledge of how does the knowledge of human impact our academic activities, especially in in the teaching and learning, uh, you know, uh, activities, right? So, like we discussed before this, that we are now going beyond epistemology. We are also looking at the value aspect, you know, the practice aspect, and also the reality of the subject matter that we generate and disseminate. Right, so I think you are all very lucky to have uh, Ustaz Tafsin here. Hopefully, we will have much takeaway from our session with him today. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 And share the philosophy and missions of IAU, and particularly the roles and the imperative uh, uh, strategies of AHAS RKHS, and what is the uh, directive of this Kulia, and to um, uh, produce holistic stuff and education, education uh, stuff, academic stuff, and also being involved in community engagement. To relate with the contemporary issues, uh, this is how uh, we are working uh, to reach our mission of the university and to accomplish uh, the philosophies of the university uh, within the framework of Islamization and integration of human knowledge. So thank you very much, Dr. Shukran, and we also thank our deputy in Associate Professor Dr. Stephen for your uh, attendance here and participation. And now I would like to hand over the session to our moderator, who is the Assistant Professor Dr. Hussaini Bin Jami, Assistant Professor of the Department of Quran and Sunnah Studies, Ahas Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman, Kulia of Islam and Human Sciences. Thank you. 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 you. to make sure you. need me to you. Thank you. the session because we are already moderating the session. But uh, Dr. Muhlin, I think all of his uh, respect for my ustaz when he was in I am in the Quran studies, he placed my name as a director, perhaps because uh, I introduced uh, the speaker uh, to the uh, committee. Uh, I was not on a personal contact with uh, Mr. Tassim before. I knew him from his book, uh, particularly from the recent uh, book fest, uh, for the National Book Fest. Uh, but he was introduced to me by a respectable team in the Istanbul University. Um, so I think um, uh, when he contacted me, he said, uh, Is there any opportunity to uh, be? Uh, in engagement, the intellectual engagement is a community of Bahas, the RKHS. I think it is a good opportunity to uh, revisit our uh, understanding, our thought, and um, our view on the subject. Particularly when we know that in Bahas and the RKHS, we are uh, trying very much uh, to dig deeper into the subject of inside. And with the establishment of many projects, uh, particularly in Saudi Arabia, we have our expert in theology here, the Hasina, such a uh, the Hasina, uh, we uh, work on the subject as well. And so, um, uh, 
we know that uh, you know, all of these projects are looking uh, forward to perspectives and nuances in the subject of design. I myself, I did uh, uh, present a topic on design and also uh, on psychology before. So we are very much uh, uh, interested in the subject of design, particularly I think with the advancement of AI and we are now revisiting who is inside <laughs> or what is inside, who are inside in the uh, coming age. So when we look at the trying to define the assets of inside, we will have to revisit the origin of inside, particularly from the religious perspective. So I think I will not uh, delve deeper into uh, the significant introduction of this subject. Uh, most of us are familiar with many of the uh, views in general, the creationist and the evolutionist uh, perspective on the subject. Uh, but for a brief uh, in, in the introduction of our speaker, Ustaz uh, Tahsin, the educational background, he uh, became his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering in 2002 from Isaac Jackson, Jackson University in Philadelphia, uh, and also Alimia in the Dust and Zone. Uh, so uh, traditional uh, approach, uh, traditional system, uh, that's the zone completed in 2020. Uh, current employment is a Bachelor of Islamic Theology at Darussalam Seminary, Chicago, United States, and also at the same time, a chemical engineer. So juggling between two jobs, <laughs> Bachelor of Islamic Theology and a chemical engineer at the United States, pattern and trademark office. Publication. I think most of us are familiar with the provenance of man, Sunni apologetic of the original creation of Adam. And there is a forthcoming publication uh, we, we published in Malaysia. Is it Malaysia? Yeah. Okay. So now it's very close to Malaysia. <laughs> okay. Uh, and several other conferences. And uh, he was a co founder of Darul Hossein Institute and Nahla Institute for Women. Uh, and I think that uh, we'll. Uh, give us some uh, idea of his interest and uh, his dedication to the subject of man and the color perspective of man. So without further ado, uh, I have the honor to invite our speaker uh, to deliver his talk. Um, I think uh, one hour, so one hour, and then we'll have the Q&A session after that. I guess it will be until 4 p.m. Shabbat. Uh, so, yeah, please, I'll get the moment to go on. Start by saying. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbi al-alameen. Wa akbar salati wa sallu al-takhreem. Ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Mahma alimna ma yanta'na wa anta'na bina ajma'na. Wa zidna ilman wa ikhlasan wa hilma. Amma ba'an. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I want to begin by expressing my uh, the utmost gratitude to everyone here for attending this uh, talk of mine, uh, especially to Dr. Uh, Husseini, who I've been in touch with, and as well as Dr. Mahdeen and our dean uh, for giving me this great opportunity to be here to speak at the Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman Kudiyah. Truly, it is an honor for me to be here. Um, I don't come here as a teacher. I come here as a mere sharer of information. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الْفِكْرَ تَنْتَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So in that sense, I come here to remind one another that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on a certain matter, such that it will benefit the mu'mineen, that this reminder will benefit us. And so on that, with that intention, I'd like to begin here um, with a premise.
So one of the things that our scholars mentioned in books on uh, one of the key subjects that use, that is studied in Islamic curriculum, classical curriculum, is known as the science of uh, deliberation. And one of the things that they mention in those manuals is that you cannot have a fruitful discussion with anyone until you've established a premise that both of you agree upon. And only then can you progress in a fruitful discussion with your interlocutor, with your discussant. And so when writing this book on this subject, I wanted to begin with a premise that I hope my reader would accept. And in fact, it is the only premise I ask of my reader to accept, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only divine, ascribed with the most perfect and complete attributes, transcendent beyond blemishes and defects of any kind, who revealed his mu'jizah, his inimitable, uh, inimitable Qur'an to his most trustworthy and truthful servant, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the final criterion between truth and falsehood, free of discrepancies, untruths, and doubts. It's the only single premise that I ask that people to do the theme of in order to benefit from this work. From here, I want to give a, an overview of what I will be discussing. Shall I hope I can move quickly? As you know, one of the most challenging things is that you write on a subject uh, 150 pages, and then you're asked to kind of distill that into 40, 45 minute discussion. And it becomes very challenging. In fact, it becomes more challenging than writing the book. <laughs> so, but inshallah, um, I, I hope that I can fulfill that uh, in, in a reasonable manner. So I'll begin with a, an introduction, followed by uh, a discussion on what empirical methods tell us. And then I will discuss the, the single most important verse in the Quran that speaks about the subject, the context relating to that. And finally, I'll end with a conclusion. Impact of the theory of evolution on theology. One of the things that attracted me to this subject is that um, I, early on, I found out that the first refutation against the theory of evolution written by Muslims was 140 years ago. And so that took me by surprise, and I thought to myself, why are Muslims still discussing this topic after 140 years? Why hasn't it been, why hasn't it been uh, resolved? Why is this topic so, why does it garner so much attention? I was telling Dr. Hussein earlier that no matter where you go, whether it be in America, whether it be in Malaysia, Turkey, uh, the Middle East, People want to speak about this topic. And this has been the case for 140 years now. And so that immediately took my interest. And the other thing that I wanted to mention that is equally important is that, broadly speaking, whenever you speak about a topic within science and then speak about a topic within revelation or within the religion, it's very, very important that you first are able to, to determine if there is truly a contradiction, sometimes what you find is that science is saying one thing, religion seems to be saying something different, but the two may not be in contradiction with one another. There may be a reasonable explanation to resolve the, the, the apparent contradiction. So one of the things I wanted to immediately determine is that, could it be the case that we have a reconcilable contradiction? Or is it the case on the, um, that we have a irreconcilable contradiction? And that was one of the things that I wanted to determine. And so from the standpoint, as everybody here knows, uh, the demands of the theory of evolution, that it cannot be the case that any single man does not, was, was not created by way of biological parents. And so if our dean is saying to us, that Adam salam, did not have parents, and then science, through, the, through its knowledge of genetics and many other fields, is telling us, no, in fact, he must have had parents. 
then clearly there is a true contradiction here that cannot be reconciled. Because the affirmation of bio biological parents for Adam is at odds, complete odds, with the complete negation of biological parents for him. So there is a true contradiction here that cannot be resolved uh, through some other type of mechanism. So now that we have an irreconcilable contradiction, how do we, which side should we lean upon? And so this is what I wanted to get into. If we wanted to look at it in a very uh, summarized manner, what we can say is that whenever you have an issue between what science is saying and what scripture or the nusus or what the Quran and Sunnah are saying, is that there has to be a weighing of evidences. What exactly is the Quran and Sunnah saying about this matter? You know, there are these concepts, some of you may be familiar with this word, uh, or or In short, basically, you have to make a determination that is the Quran and Sunnah, is it saying in decisive terms that Adam did not have parents? Is it decisive? And then furthermore, is it also decisive in the way that it, it has reached us? Obviously, the Quran all of it is all of it is decisive in the transmission of how it reached us. But in the ahadith, we know that you have sahih, you have hasan, you have ba'is, you have many different categories. And so if that's the case, is our knowledge of Adam salam not having parents? Is it coming through perhaps a hadith that is weak? So that's also something to be spoken about. And then on the other side, on the scientific side, is science saying in the most decisive, decisive terms that this man, Adam salam, could not have had parents? Is that the case? And so that needs to be looked at. However, one thing we do know for sure is that it cannot be the case that what science is saying, that if science is saying something in explicit, decisive terms, and the Quran and Sunnah are also saying something in clear, decisive terms. The two are contradiction with one another. A contradiction cannot exist. Why? Because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala Himself mentions in the Quran in the ayah that I have up there. Do they not reflect on this Quran? Had it been from anyone other than Allah? they would have certainly found in it many inconsistencies. So that the fact that Allah himself is mentioning explicitly that this Quran will not be in contradiction with what is reality, with what is the truth, tells us that there has to be, one has to be, in terms of weighing the evidence, one has to weigh heavier than the other. It cannot be the case that the two are equal and they are both at odds with one another. Okay? One of the things that I, I, um, I took part in a lot of discussions early on in my research with Muslims who are evolutionists. And one of the things that I quickly realized is that many people don't believe in the theory of evolution because they're convinced of the science behind it. You would think that they do, but most people believe in the theory of evolution, or people who believe in the theory of evolution believe it because they cannot fathom the idea that supernatural events can occur or miraculous events can occur. They don't, they don't accept that because they follow a philosophical naturalist point of view, a philosophical naturalist worldview. And so it's not the case that they're convinced or persuaded by the science behind it. They're in fact persuaded by the philosophical underpinnings of not wanting to accept anything that is quote unquote a miracle, such as a man being created without any parents. On the flip side, traditionally in Islamic theology or what is known as the science of Ibn al-Kalam, the way that Ibn al-Kalam looks at any issue is they ask, is this issue rationally possible? Rationally possible meaning 
that you can conceive in your mind, just based on your rash, uh, rational ability, if this is possible, impossible, or necessary. For example, if I say to you, rationally speaking, can you conceive in your mind a flying horse? Although we've never witnessed that. But we can conceive that rationally speaking, there could be a flying horse. However, if I say to you, can you conceive in your mind a square circle? You will say, no, I cannot conceive in a square circle. Because there, you cannot understand how something can both be a square, a four-sided figure, and then a circle, which doesn't have any sides, simultaneously. So your mind immediately rejects that. So that is what is known as rationally impossible. But then rationally possible would be like an example of that would be like a flying horse. That your mind doesn't find it to be the same type of problem when I said square circle. Your mind can conceive of the idea of a force being able to fly, even though we have never witnessed that, nor have we have anyone ever witnessed that. So the way that the Islamic scholars of theology define Qutba, or the omnipotence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that applies to all manners that are rationally possible. So long as that thing is rationally possible, then that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra can apply to that thing. So this is very important to lay down. And then the other important thing to, to understand is that if you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra that applies to anything that is rationally possible, and then at the same time, Allah is a freely willing agent, or what, in, or what is known as al fa'lul mukhtar that an agent that has the attribute of irada, will, volition, that it can choose to do whatever he pleases. Like he mentions in this ayah, that your Lord creates and chooses whatever he wills. The choice is not theirs. And so it's very important that we understand that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qudra can apply to anything that is rationally possible, and that he also has the ability to choose this, and if you combine these two, thing, two things together, choosing and having the power to create anything rationally possible, then what that, when you combine the two, what, what occurs then is that supernatural events are possible. Miracles are then possible. Because you have a creator who can freely choose, and you have a creator that can create that which is rationally possible. And so we can then conclude with a rational judgment, like I have here in the second bullet point, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can create a man without any biological parents. Now, the important question that, that immediately comes to mind is, but did he do that? Yes, we've established that he has the ability to do so. But ability to do so is very different than actually doing it. And so, from here, what we can speak about is the case of Isa alayhi salam that we all know that he did not have a father. One of the things that's very important to understand is that what is science, what does science have to say on a matter like this? First, what is important to lay down at the beginning is that science through empirical methods is not concerned with individuals. Science seeks to establish rules theories, laws, theorems, corollaries. Science does not seek to see, seek to determine what does, what is Zayd doing? How did Zayd come about? How did Amr come about? How did Fatima come about? Science doesn't care about it. Science wants to, wants to establish broad universals, or what is known as kudidya 
universals and studied in uh, Arabic logic, Mantir and Mantir. Science seeks to establish, lays, to lay down rules that are universals. There are general principles that apply to everyone. So if, if you were to ask a scientist, a evolutionary biologist, about a, an individual, does he have to have biological parents? Science will say, as I mentioned here, all humans must possess a pair of biological parents. That is a universal, the kuliya, the rule that science has laid down. Okay, so just understand that, that it, this is a universal judgment. However, can you have something that negates a universal judgment? One indiv individual, one example, one instance. Again, go back to our definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having qudra and irada. If we understand that theologically speaking, this is possible, then he would tell you theologically speaking, it's possible to have a, a, an instance of it, something that negates this universal judgment that scientists have laid down, that all humans must possess a pair of biological parents. I'll speak more about this in a moment, but before we go on, I wanted to speak a little bit more about what science has to say. I apologize, it's not very clear on this uh, slide, but let me just guide you through uh, what we have over here. It's actually very difficult to see, but uh, I'll explain it to you in a moment. So the question arises, what does empirical methods convey to us? When a scientist can, uh, conducts experiments in the lab, what is he or she looking for? If you look at the, the image on your right, in the larger circle, you have what I've written there, la wuku, which means the non-existing category, the larger circle on your right. Non-existing category means all those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have created but did not create such as the larger circle, you see in the darker red, you have a smaller circle, which says in there is the had, which means the impossible category. What would fall into the impossible category? The example of the square circle, that not only have, does it not exist in, in the world, but it actually cannot exist. And then on the, the image to your left, you in the largest circle, you have there what is known as the imkan category, meaning all those things that are that can possibly exist. And then in the smaller circle, you have the wufu category, which is that which actually exists, like a horse or a bird. And then finally, in the smallest circle, you have that which must necessarily exist, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a creator. Now, in these circles that we have here, what does a scientist concern himself with? A scientist concerns himself with, if you're looking at the image on the left, he concerns himself with the occurring, the, the middle circle, the wuku circle, which concerns itself with this thing that actually exists. What have we found? We found that X exists. We have, and then on the right circle, we have found that X does not exist. Science only concerns itself with the question of, does it exist or does it not exist? Science does not concern itself with, with the rationally impossible category or the rationally possible category because it's only using empirical methods which are tools of detection, trying to detect, does it exist? Or does it not exist? So immediately you see that there is a drawback. Not a drawback, but there is certain things that empirical methods does not, uh, or does, uh, does not uh, have any concern with. And that is the rationally possible category and the rationally impossible category. Another question that always comes, to, uh, comes up is, is our religion against science? And the answer is an emphatic no. 
If you look at any classical manual that Muslims used to study in Islamic uh, seminaries thou a thousand years ago, in in the in the science of logic or what is known as mantiq, there's a there's a chapter called al yaqiniyat which means those things that give you certainty about certain matters. And under this chapter, there's a chapter on inductive reason, istifra, and a chapter on, lo and behold, scientific experimentation, or what they used to call tajriba. So clearly, the fact that Muslim scholars well over a thousand years ago were saying that inductive reasoning and scientific experiment experimentation can give you yaqini knowledge tells you immediately that our deen cannot be against science. In fact, it uses science for so many things, for the benefit of mankind. So this notion that we're hearing from some quarters of Islamic scholarship that science cannot be reconciled with, with the religion, and that the two are always at odds with one another is completely false. In fact, anybody who's saying that, they themselves are not familiar with, with, the, with the tradition. And so on this point, what I wanted to say is that there is something I wrote here, evolutionary science yields gnomic certainty. What does gnomic certainty mean? Gnomic certainty means what science usually finds to be the case. What does science usually find to be the case? That all people have a pair of biological parents. And they, we know through genetics why this must be the case. And every time that you and I ever meet somebody for the first time, we don't even think for a moment that, I wonder, does this person have a mother? Does this person have a father? Could it have been the case that this person doesn't have a father? That thought doesn't even come to our mind because it's so ingrained in our mind that every single person must have a pair of biological parents. And science has proven this through genetics and through many different fields that evolutionary science speaks about of why this must be the case. And so the, the, there's no mixed certainty there, or what we call in Arabic, wajib adi, that it must be the case that all humans must possess a pair of biological parents. And in books of Arabic logic in, in Ibn Mantiq, they say that when you have achieved gnomic certainty, wajib adi, then it will stand as a dalil, as a hujja, so long as you don't have some evidence that speaks to the contrary of that dalil. And this is why we should never doubt this no make certainty that all humans must possess a pair of biological parents. Now, notice it says there, absent stronger evidence to the contrary. What kind of evidence are we speaking about here? What kind of evidence would it take to overturn this no make certainty that science has given us that all humans must possess a pair of biological parents? So on this question, we have over here on this slide, <laughs> it has to be a type of evidence that is unequivocal, both dalala and thabut, that shows that, that this gnomic certainty that all, all uh, humans must possess a pair of biologic parents is not true. The mere rational possibility that Allah could create a man without uh, humans is insufficient. You have to show unequivocal evidence that this has occurred. Okay? Remember that the mere rational possibility that we establish that Allah could create a man without parents is insufficient. You have to show that it actually occurred. How are we going to do that? One of the things that early on in my research, one time, actually before I even began my research, I was speaking to a Muslim evolutionist. And he asked me, what is, why do you believe that Adam did not have parents? What is your proof? 
And I said to him this first ayah, at the, the last part of the ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders Iblis to make sujood to prostrate to Adam on his time, the famous story, and he refuses to do so. And the reason he gives is that he says, that you have created him from clay. So I said to this individual, clearly if Adam Islam was made from clay, then he didn't have parents. And then he said to me very quickly, the second ayah of that here, where it, where, it, where it begins with, So he asked me, are you also, you have no parents? Because it says here, خَلَقَكُمْ so then right away I, I became quiet. I didn't know what to say. Because he, he seems to have a valid point. That if if this ayah is our proof, or other ayah that speak about Adam and his salam being created with clay, or with water, or with uh, other things, then when Allah is saying that you too have been created with these things, then why could, could, it, could, it, been the, could it have been the case that just like our understanding of the second ayah is that no, we were originally, originally created from clay, that maybe Adam and Islam did have parents, but that originally his first components were made from clay. If you go up the, the ladder of theory of evolution, then he, he too was created from clay, but he had parents just like we had. So he said, couldn't, it be, couldn't that be the case based on your understanding of these verses? So I said, you know what? He has a he has a point. And this is this is why this is a dilemma. So from there, I thought to myself. I asked some of my teachers. Then what is our proof? Why do we believe that Adam and Islam did not have parents? So one of my teachers said that no, actually, the greatest proof for this is ijma consensus. So then I went back to that individual. And I said to him that our greatest proof is actually consensus. The fact that if you take somebody from Malaysia, a little boy, maybe 10 years old, and then you go to Nigeria, and you take a man from Nigeria, and then you go all the way to America, and you take a, a young girl from, from America, and you ask all, all three of them, did Adam and Islam have parents? All three will say no. So the consensus is is. It's very strong. There's very few things in the deen that you can find that have such a strong consensus where even little boys and girls were, are taught and they know that Adam and son did not have parents. So I went back to this individual and I said to him that it's a matter of consensus. So he said to me, don't you find it to be somewhat disingenuous to quote a consensus that predates the theory of evolution. In other words, he said to me that you were quoting, and I showed him uh, books that uh, were like 200, 300 years old, where they said, uh, books of the seer, that they said that uh, you know there's a consensus on this matter from this mufassir or from this scholar. And he said to me, don't you think it's something it's disingenuous to quote a scholar and who's quoting consensus on this matter that predates the theory of evolution? Could it have not been the case that if the same scholar, the same Mufassir, knew about what the theory of evolution says, then they would not have agreed that there would have been some differences of opinion? And then he said, today, we have many contemporary Muslim scholars who don't believe that Adam and Islam had, um, uh, didn't have parents. So just because they understand the theory of evolution. So just as scholars today have a difference of opinion, Maybe if those older classical scholars knew about the theory of evolution, they too would have differed with one another. And then you would not have had this strong consensus. So he, say, he says to me, I agree that ijma has a role to play in our deen. But on this issue, I think it's disingenuous for you to quote. Again, I was put into a dilemma because I thought to myself, that he has a point. Why am I quoting a consensus that predates the knowledge of the theory of the world? That just like we have Muslim scholars today who differ on this subject, maybe they would have differed if they knew about this information prior. So now another dilemma, what to do? 
And then, I don't want to get into the details, uh, but I came across a book by Imam al juwayn called Al-Riyat al umm where he says that if you have a consensus that is very, very strong on a certain matter, yet the basis of that consensus is unknown for what they call the Muslim, then do not think that there is no basis. Rather, what may have happened and does happen is that sometimes people get used to just providing as their proof that this is a matter of consensus without providing the basis. So what happens over time is the basis becomes lost and all that remains is this is a matter of consensus. Why? Because it's gone uncontested for so long. It was never an issue for so long. And so people, they didn't really talk about it. And so people didn't know immediately what is the basis for this consensus. All they know is that we have consensus. But if somebody were to ask, well, what is the, the basis of this consensus? Why did so many people form a strong consensus on this issue? People are like, oh, I don't know. You know, that's a good question. I don't know what the basis is. But we know we have consensus. And so this, I thought to myself, Imam Jumaini is saying that there has to be a basis. Then I have to look for that basis. What is that basis? And so that took me to looking at the various ayat in the Quran to see, is there a unifying basis to show why we have such a strong consensus on the fact that Adam and Islam did not have parents. And I looked at every single verse that spoke about this. And I would look at up to a hundred different books of tafsir on every single verse to see if I can find at least one verse that is strong enough to again overturn that that no mixed certainty that science tells us that every single human must have a pair of biological parents. And so I look and um you can continue like roughly or about months. So one of the things, if you study with Surah Tafsir, you know that there are three things that the Mufassi women look for, in particular, generally speaking, to find out what an ayah is saying. Number one, what they call the reason for the revelation, Salabun Muzi. What is the reason for why this ayah was revealed? The second thing they look for is the context of the verse, or what is known as siyah, that where does this verse fall into in the, the surah, in the chapter, uh, amongst the different ayat that come before and after. And then finally, there's this thing called the qarina tul aqal, that what does the aqal say about this particular matter? Now, bearing these three signifiers in mind, I began my uh, quest, so to speak, to look for an ayah that I can show. And the single most important ayah in the entire Quran that shows this, uh, that speaks about the subject, is the ayah I have written up there. Inna mathada Isa inda Allah kamathari Adam khalaqahu min turab thumma qala lahu kun sayakuru. In Surah Ali Imran, verse number 59. What is the sabab al nuzul of this ayah? The Christians of Najran came to the Prophet uh, in a time period that was after the Battle of Badr, but before, right before the Battle of Uhud. And they came to him, and the Prophet invited them to Islam. And they said to him that we are actually already Muslim. And the Prophet said, no, you believe that Isa is divine. And so they asked him, then who then was the father of Isa And so the Prophet became silent because he wanted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to explain to him. 
much. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the first 80 verses of Surah Ali Imran. Amongst which is verse number 59. So clearly, if you look at the Sabah al Nuzul here, you see what's going on here is that the Christians of Najran wanted to make a case that Isa salam, was divine because he didn't have a biological father. So the reasoning in their minds was, if an individual doesn't have a biological father, only a mother, then God, na'udhu billah, must be his father. And so this is why this individual, Isa salam, is divine. Now bearing that in mind, if we go to the second signifier, which is the context of where this verse falls into this surah. We don't have time to look into every single ayah, but if you were to look at these ayahs, uh, ayah that I read here, the second verse, the sixth verse, all these verses that come before verse 59, and then after verse 59, if you look at that context, what you will see is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to repeatedly negate divinity, uluhiyya, for Isa alayhi salam. Every single time in these, in these ayat, you'll see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is negating divinity for it. So if you look at the context of where this verse falls into in Surah Ali Imran, what you will see is that he's trying to repeatedly negate divinity for Isa, for Isa alayhi salam. And then finally, the, the third signifier, which I mentioned was using the aqad. There's a book that is studied in seminaries for many, many years now, hundreds of years now, called Muqtasar al-Ma'ani, Balagha. Imam al is the author, very celebrated scholar of our ummah. And he says in that book, after quoting this ayah, then produce a surah like it. Many of you are familiar with this ayah, this is from the Tahadi verses. But those verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging the Qurayshi Arabs to produce something like the Qur'an. And Imam al-Tahdizani in his book, Mukhtasar al-Ma'ani, he states that this ayah is proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far beyond including even one ineloquent word in the Qur'an such that it would lead to him being attributed with jahad, with ignorance, or ajiz, or safa, foolishness, or, or impotence. Why? Because you can imagine, if Allah himself is asking the Qurayshi Arabs, produce something like this Qur'an, but then the Qur'an itself is not living up to the challenge of being eloquent, tasih, balid, then there's a problem there. How can you ask others to to provide something that you yourself have not lived up to that standard. So Imam al says that this ayah is a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is not a single word in the Quran that can be attributed with ineloquence. Keep, keeping that in mind, and I want to go through this a little bit quicker, that any tafsir that falls short of confirming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not lived up to this challenge himself in the Quran cannot be the correct tafsir. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself guarantees that every single ayah in the Quran, every single word in the Quran lives up to this challenge. So it cannot any tafsir which fails to meet this foundational principle of being eloquent in the Qur'an, it results in Allah being attributed with ignorance, impotence, and or foolishness. And so that tafsir has to be necessarily rejected. Remember to that, remember that first premise that we spoke about, that I said every single person must believe in, if they want to benefit from this book, is that they have to, be, they have to believe that Allah, your creator, is not ignorant, is not impotent, is not foolish. So if you if you cannot safeguard that through your tafsir, then this will not 
uh, this book will not benefit you. But if you do believe that, then we can move further and progress and benefit. And then here, obviously, if, we, if we're talking about eloquence in the Quran, we have to understand the definition of eloquence in the Quran. There's many definitions that the scholars have given of what constitutes something to be eloquent in Arabic according to the classical Arabic scholars during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And what they mentioned, if you look at the last bullet point, it is the most important bullet point, which states that balaba, or what it means to be eloquent in Arabic language, is that you speak, when you speak about something, you speak according to the context of what, what the situation is. It cannot be the case that you are an eloquent person when you are not speaking to the demands of the context, or what is known as the notion of that you are conforming to the demands of the context and the situation at hand. Remember what the context of the situation at hand is. The reason for the revelation was because the Christians of Najran came to the Prophet and they told him that Isa is divine because he didn't have a biological father. Remember the context of the verse. That before the verses before uh, verse 59 and after are all trying to negate divinity for Isa. Therefore, the demands in order to be eloquent in, in this verse means that you must show some type of way where you're persuasively showing that Isa salam, despite not having biological paternity, still is not divine. The verse must show this. In order for this verse to be eloquent according to the rules of the Arabic language, it must provide this information. It cannot be the case that this verse does not provide that information and still be considered to be eloquent according to the rules of Arabic language. And then it uses, uh, I think I'll, I'll go over this uh, very quickly because it, there's not a, enough time to go into detail. But if you look at this verse, it's trying to make a comparison between Isa and Adam And according to the rules of Balagha, this simile, or what is known in Arabic as Tashbih, according to the rules of Tashbih, the, the thing that you're comparing, it must, be, it must be more known to the person that you're speaking to than the thing itself. That is, and that will show that you're using the rules of Balagha correctly. In other words, when, when Muslim evolutionists, when they do, when they do tafsir of this ayah, they say that, oh, maybe it's the case that Adam alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling some new information about Adam alayhi salam that's in this ayah. But that cannot be the case. If you take that tafsir, then you will be violating the rules of Arabic Balagha. And you will be forced to say, that this verse is not eloquent. But what can we know? That every single verse in the Quran must be eloquent or else it results in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not living up to the same challenge that he gave to the Qurayshi Arabs. So obviously that tafsir has to be rejected because it results in, in attributing Allah to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with ignorance. Rather, it must be the case that Adam alayhi salam that what he was known for during that time of the Prophet, that it must be something that he was well known about. And what was he well known about? That he didn't have parents. If you say that he did have parents, then this entire verse would become ineloquent. It would not be eloquent anymore. And so that is, in conclusion, I'll end here because I... I think anymore if I go into here, it, it will just kind of prolong everything. Uh, in conclusion, this verse is the single most important verse in the entire Quran, which, in my opinion, proves that Adam and did not have parents 
And I, I think I've asked many people, see, I've asked many people to, to review the work. And Alhamdulillah, it's been well received in that regard that it seems to be the case that this is the basis for that consensus. That the, the, the early scholars and the early salaf saw this verse as that unifying cause of why uh, Adam did not have parents. So I, I end with that. And um, if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, feel free to ask. Yeah. Sorry, I, I just want to say that I, like I said, I went through this fairly quickly, and obviously there's many more details that are found in the book that really talk about this in, a, in an in-depth manner. So I urge uh, for those who are interested uh, to read through the book, and then uh, you can get in touch with me if you like. If you have any questions, um, and then we can. Uh, Answering questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that very systematic and gradually building the discourse. So then uh, I think um, I understand the passion, and when you dedicate yourself to a topic. And you have been in that topic for a long time. You discover many subtleties in that mm -hmm. topic that, you know, in order to deliver it within a limited time range, it's very challenging. And also, you, you, you kind of feel you know, there are things that I haven't delivered, and it's very important. But I think uh, within that, um, the culture of reading before coming uh, to a talk or to a lecture. Or, uh, preparing yourself, so I believe most of uh, our audience are already uh, you know, having their own uh, uh, wonderings, their own questions that uh, they uh, they wish to, to to discuss with the author, with our speaker today. Um, so, uh, if there is any point of discussion or any comments, any questions, if <laughs> some. <laughs> so I welcome and to start a discussion. I think uh, yeah, because uh, we need some time to figure out where we should go. <laughs> should be <laughs> as for me, my personally, I when I. Mean, I I was so much interested in, in the, you know, the status or, or the role of hadith because as a, an academic in hadith studies yeah. that uh, the discussion it falls down to the hadith of that suburb yeah. yeah. so the epistemic status of that hadith will come to absolutely yeah. and I looked into that uh, a lot yeah. I looked into many different narrations that speak about that suburb of Nuzu, yeah. the story of the Christians of Nuzul um, and, and I found a tremendous amount of uh, information in that regard uh, to the extent that scholars like al Razi um, and uh, a couple other scholars they said that the, there's a consensus on the sum of the two of this. Yeah, that sum. Exactly. That even that is much more that uh, that this verse, these verses were revealed because of the Christians. Yeah, that is very interesting. Because usually you find the responses will be like, you know, why do you have to rely upon so the hadith yeah. where as we mentioned before, it should be qatay yeah. subud. And then and you bring zonmi subud into the picture and then oh no, this shouldn't be in the yeah. discussion on evolution, empirical versus uh, traditional and so, so forth. So yeah. uh, and uh, from my experience, mm -hmm. in most cases, you'll find you know, eventually you will have to somehow refer to hadith. Yeah, no, I, for sure. Yeah, and in this regard, I had to rely extensively. <laughs> okay, so anyone would like to share? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, this. Um, <laughs> 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 
تفضل حتى بالعربيه اذا كان هناك سؤال بالعربيه طبعا تشغل العربيه نعم يس يس So the book is the, the discussion of the books, more on the other fiction, fiction of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's your opinion about the other opinion that Adam is perception of accepted from the book, the evolution film, but the other fiction things, yeah. maybe this. <coughs> Yeah, no, okay. Yeah. That's kind of yeah. the evolution of other things that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, often asked question. Uh, sorry, just to repeat really this question. Um, he's asking that, okay, you spoke about humans, you spoke about other and in your book, but what about other creations? You know, what is our stance? Uh, have they evolved? as the theory of evolution says, or are they original creations? Or they go back to an original creation, meaning like you have a first giraffe uh, that did not evolve from something else. You have a first plant uh, or a first uh, dog that did not evolve from something else, but it, you, you actually have a first dog. So um, it seems to be the case that theologically speaking, meaning according to Aqida, that you could, if you were convinced by the evidence of theory of evolution, you could believe that for other creations. That if you believe that for other animals in, in creation, you would not fall into a theological issue, a theological problem. But when it comes to uh, humans, then it, as I've shown, it becomes a theological issue. Does that make sense? Yes, I can speak Arabic. 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 Yes, I إذا نظرنا إليه فنظر الله عز وجل يثبت أن آدم عليه السلام خلق من طين والشيطان أيضا يعني يعترف بهذا يقول خلقتني من نار وخلقته من طين فمن أين نشأ هذا الخلاف يعني لا هو في جانب الحق ولا هو في جانب الباطل فمن شاء الخلاف يعني من أين يعني نقول جاءت هذه الفكرة أن خلق الإنسان ليس من طين إنما كان مثلا قردا ثم بعد ذلك تحول مع أن الشيطان يثبت أنه ادم مخلوق من تراب من طين والله عز وجل يقول هذا فيعني مثل هذه الاشياء في اي شيء في اي فئه نصنفه so she repeated his question he's asking that where did this uh, contention between uh, that Adam Islam was created from clay And others say that, oh, he is created from uh, apes, uh, monkeys, uh, in, in the ayah that we had on, on the slide as well that, uh, that he uh, quoted. So where did, how did this difference uh, come about? You know, um, in my opinion, I don't think this difference existed before. When I looked at books of tafsir, uh, even when in, in the ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Adam and Islam being created from clean or from, from water or from turab, the mufassirun, they would only write like one sentence, two sentences, and that's it. They're because it wasn't challenged. Nobody cared. But only since Charles Darwin in the 1850s, then people wanted to, wanted to know. So that the ikhtilaf came from them. I remember in the beginning I said that Muslims have been speaking about evolution for 140 years. The first person to write a 
refutation, a rad against evolution was Jamal al Din 140 years ago. And then after that, what's interesting is that he wrote the first refutation against evolution. And then his own student, Muhammad Abdul, said that he writes in his in his Tafsir al Mana or Rashid uh, Rada's Tafsir al Mana under Surah uh, Nisa. Uh, he mentions that Adam alayhi salam having no parents is not qat'i fidilarity. It's not qat'i. But his own teacher said he got a refutation. So the the uh, the mention of the khilaf comes from Muhammad Abu. This is what I've seen in history. And then many people adopted it after him. Many people in Egypt, after uh, during the time of Muhammad Abdul, and he had some scholars in Turkey who also said it. And then even in uh, places like Pakistan, you had uh, many people don't know this, but uh, the famous poet Muhammad Iqbal, uh, Iqbal himself believed in evolution of, of humans. Uh, doc, the famous Dr. Yisrael Ahmed of Pakistan. Uh, you have many, many intellectuals who then made this into a big argument that no, 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 you know, they could, they could have came from apes. And so. I know I didn't answer your question completely, but it's something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the mean is is it immediate conversion or it can be through generations mean drop is not immediately from drop but from other days or origins until you come to the drop at, at the at the very end at the very beginning the so both of them accept the ayat but they differ and so that is also where they can study yeah, but e even in hadith, the Prophet says, uh, kullukum, kullukum So that it tells us that all of you are from the children of Adam. The Prophet said to the Sahaba that all of you are from the children of Adam, and Adam is from clay or dirt. So in, in, when you read this hadith, what hap, what you uh, understand in your mind is that Adam Islam was the starting point. And we are all children of Adam. That it cannot be the case that Adam uh, you know, had parents and then they had parents and then finally there was Qur'an. So, you know, like immediately Adam and Islam himself was made from Thura. Um, but this hadith, some of the scholars said that it wasn't Sahih, and so that's why I, I didn't uh, use it in the book as much as uh, the ayah. It's uh, again to bring the epistemic status of hadith. Yeah, and which is why it's, it's, it's a very important discussion. <laughs> Even at the beginning of my study, I didn't uh, vision that the study of hadith would be needed so much in the debate between science and religion. And suddenly after, sometimes you see that all debates will somehow include hadith, particularly if you are bringing the transmissional, traditional perspective to counter the rational or the empirical uh, I mean, uh, influences or valuations. Um, any any other discussion one would like to bring? We still have some time. A... Are there people online? Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah.
Otherwise, the you know, you feel that there is another point that you think it should be like the while you are in Malaysia. <laughs> Um, you want to say about this? Yes. So, um, I think if we just speak generally, that whenever you have a case that science is saying something, and then you're the dean is saying something, uh, what what do you what what is the first thing you should do? And so in my, in my experience, the first thing we should do is first to determine, do you truly have a phenomenon? Do you truly have a contradiction? Because sometimes what happens is that you think you have a contradiction, but they're not saying, they're not referring to the same thing, and it can be resolved. So it first needs to be understood that you, it needs, it needs to be determined that do you have a contradiction or do you not have? Let me give you an example. So according to quantum mechanics, there, some of the quantum uh, theorists, they say that we have proven that things can pop into existence without a cause. Like the Big Bang, you know, when they say that the Big Bang happened without a cause. And quantum theory, quantum <laughs> mechanics, proves that things can pop into existence without a cause. Now, obviously, that's very problematic for us, theologically, because we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created creation. So how do we understand that quantum mechanics is saying this thing? <laughs> And then our dream is saying something that seems to oppose it. Is there a, a contradiction? So here, what we can say is that when quantum mechanics says that things can pop into existence without a cause, what they're saying is that things can pop into existence without a material cause. And there's a massive difference between saying something can occur without a cause and then saying something cannot something can occur without a material cause. Because we can still maintain causality. Uh, the principle of causality by saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a material thing. And so you don't need a material cause for something to occur, according to our aqidah. Something can occur, something can be a cause for something else without that cause being a material cause. And so now we've reconciled the contradiction. You're saying that things can pop into existence without a material cause? That's fine. We believe in that. Because we, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not like a material thing like this table that's made out of wood or made out of gold. So yes, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a, a created the, the, the universe without himself being a material cause. And we also, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, What does badi'a mean? If you look at what the mutasirun, they say, it said that badi means to create without something prior, some prior uh, uh, material. So here we would say to the, to the quantum theorists that 
there is no real contradiction between what we're saying and you're saying. In fact, we're on the same page. You're saying that things can occur with, without a material cause, and we say we've been saying that. So here, this is an example that what science seems to be saying. At first glance, it seems to be contradicting what we're saying, but that we can resolve the contradiction. So that's the first step that anybody should make when they're looking to find uh, reconcile contradiction. In fact, many of the ulama from many, many years ago, they have written books on how to understand and reconcile uh, discrepancies that we find in, in hadith compared to what we see in reality. Uh, books like by Imam al Rahawi, uh, Sheikh Mushkil al Athar, Ibn Qutayba's uh, work, uh, uh, these things have been written about for many, many years. This is not like a new thing that we're developing. Obviously, there's going to be new ways of doing it, but a new arguments. But this, this idea of reconciling what we see in reality and then what our religion are saying, it has been around for 1,200, 1,300 years. So there's a prior precedent for this. So that was just some general advice on how to approach the topic of uh, science and religion. Yeah. Any other uh, uh, questions or comments? I find it very interesting, but I uh, can give it to you later. But uh, when, when you speak of uh, now, with um, the effect of all these issues, these uh, discoveries, uh, you know, sight on the mechanics. So we have somehow you know, uh, speak of different degrees of meaning. You know, when you say cause, now you have to somehow specify the meaning of cause, like you know, material cause, non-material cause, yeah. immaterial cause, or like primary cause, secondary cause. And so it's an interesting uh, phenomenon that somehow when you look at the works of early scholars, their understanding of words, of meanings, are quite different from the layman, from the everyday language. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, would you agree that sometimes the contradictions, uh, the misunderstandings occur due to, you know, the generalization in, in understanding of meaning, or sometimes when you generalize that, okay, when you have science, and religion is always either science or religion, or maybe in some cases it is science, in some cases it is religion. Not to say that science wins over religion, but in that sense, the religion that we thought as religion is Zonni or is not the uh, fundamentals, it's not the established one. So maybe we, we, we need to put it into specific cases rather than having a generalized statement or, or conclusion to say that this wins over this one or this wins over this one. What do you think? Yes. So you, are you specifically asking about uh, understanding in terms of the language? Yeah, in terms of language and in terms of our our approach or strategy in specific specifying specification, maybe yeah. that that is required uh, when we say to be a uh, distinguished individuals, one who can distinguish between meanings and distinguish between yeah. issues. So the idea of distinguishing between meanings is, is, a, is a big problem. Yeah. You know, for example, when it comes to the Arabic language, yeah. um, you know, the scholars, they say that they, they have this term called Ahlul Loha. Yeah. Ahlul Loha, although just uh, on the surface, it just means people of, of the Arabic language. But Ahlul Loha uh, is a it's a technical term. It's uh, you know, it's a, it's found as a Salahi term, and what it means is that for anybody who lived before two hundred Hijri. So if you lived after like two hundred and fifty Hijri, you are no longer considered min ahlul because they said that the Arabic language went through so much change already within that short period of time, 
that they didn't consider you to be like those that lived during prior to 250 years. So right away, we saw a shift in, in understanding language. And obviously, if there's a shift in understanding language, language there's going to be a shift in understanding meanings. Yes. So the right, right away, you have a huge impact there. So you know, to your point, there, this is very important to understand that if your deen is telling you something in the Quran or in the Sunnah, to make sure you understand every single word as it was said by the one who spoke it. By the Prophet ﷺ, when he recited the Quran for the first time or when he would narrate a uh, uh, hadith, it's very important that we try to determine what every single word means so that that shift in meaning doesn't occur. That we think that we've understood, but or we think that it's abundant, but maybe it is public or the vice versa. So it, it's, it's not an easy task, yes. it's very difficult. I'm sorry. Uh, can I have a bit of a toss? That's fine. I don't want to say it. Sure. Uh, the first question is if we uh, choose to stand with the uh, saying that we are going to oppose the uh, evolution, that is it mean that we also need to oppose the uh, general history of the world, like the stone leaders, like the ice leaders, and like the one that they see the important elements. Um, so let me just add to the first question. So, uh, no, they, like I said, that according to Aqidah, according to your theology, Islamic theology, you must affirm that Adam was an original creation, that he did not have parents. So, obviously, then the theory of evolution. Uh, at, at least uh, on a macro level, does not apply to Benua, does not apply to the human species. If you want to believe in the Ice Age and the Stone Age and the fossil record uh, for all other plants and animals, that's fine. It's not an Aqidah issue. So the only Aqidah issue occurs is with Benua. Uh, sorry, my, my sole opinion is about. The ayah from Surah Asad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, but it has a way to move. I checked in the simple uh, translation and said that, so if I have proportion here and bring to something, that's a way to move. That doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make Adam himself, or maybe that have some kind of Think that Ihtiman would be like this one. Oh, what is your... Yeah, so for you know this this concept of Thesmia, uh so way to go. Um it can they usually it usually means to like to move to fashion, to mold, to assemble, uh, assemble. to assemble, to arrange, to make even uh to proportion, uh, these are all you know ways that you can understand it. But when I looked into the books of Tafsir for this ayah, um, I did not find it to be <laughs> definitive to say that this means that Adam and did not have parents. Um, for one, uh, one issue is that he thinks so way to who. So the Muslim evolutionists will say, who is the who in this verse? So wait, who? Who is the Damir going back to, the pronoun going back? Is it going back to Adamites? Or is it going to maybe someone before Adamites? So that, you know, obviously, I, I personally believe that it goes to Adamites. But if you look at the ayah by itself, is it telling you that Adam Nisan did not have parents? It's, it may be difficult to conclude that. Allah no. This is why I believe the ayah in the Masad Isa is the strongest verse. Because it mentions the Adam Nisan saying explicitly. It doesn't use a pronoun. Right? So that's important. So, thank you. 
So you're, now your question is only for the non-Muslims. So the non-Muslim, <laughs> the most important thing to speak to a non-Muslim is not about the creation of Adams. The most important thing to speak to a non-Muslim is about so he, right? So this is why, you know, many people have asked me the same question. Oh, how, how do you then speak to non-Muslims about evolution? And I tell them flatly, I don't. Because from our standpoint, when you're speaking to a non-Muslim, the theory of evolution is secondary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you have to first establish that will heed with them, that they first get, so that then they honor the Quran as Kitabullah, Kalamullah. What is the common point we can say? So, what is the common point? The Quranic perspective. What is the common point between us and the non Muslims? Yeah. Not, not uh, my specific non Muslims, like atheists and non believers. But looking on a common point. To convey them about evolution, yeah. But that's what I'm saying that the discussion should not be about evolution with them. Discussion to them should be about da'wah, should be about tawheed, why they should believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we're talking about a completely different discussion. Yeah. I think it's a, it would be a waste of your time to speak to a non Muslim atheist about evolution. You know, I, I honestly feel it's a waste of If you time. give hundreds of explanation, it still wouldn't matter. It would not matter. Don't benefit. If they do you can quote to him every single ayah. What will, how will he be convinced of it? Right? And even if he was convinced and he said, fine, mm -hmm. your Adam had, uh, was, did not have parents, but I don't believe in, in your creator. Then what, what is it? <laughs> I don't believe in Allah, or I don't believe in the Prophet. I don't believe in this Quran. So it's not like you achieved something, right? But what you're trying to achieve is that this under person understands your deen and then accepts it. Right? <laughs> Based on the Iman, first they have to accept the creation of God and then you have to go further. Okay, right. Can I add this one? Sure, sure. I think that this Quranic verse was indicated to Ahlul Kitab yeah. at that time when the revelation was revealed and Prophet system was in Medina. When he traveled to Medina, so there were Nasara and Yahudi, and some of them were hypocrites, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to call them like Kalimat in Sawa. Kalimat in Sawa is the Kalimat of Yeah. Right? So Ahlul Kitab al Yahud, their origin is Tawheed. Right, exactly. The Nasara origin is Tawheed. There is the Kalimat of the Sawai, Kalimat Sawai in Bainana, wa Bainana. So this is, that was a reminder to them from Allah. Actually, you are misleading or you are like, uh, there is something that is not your origin. Yeah. So you come to the origin. That is the Kalimatin. Sawa Baina Wali is a Kalimatin Taku. So it, we cannot, you know, uh, relate this message and remind them, uh, you know, to the non believers today. Because now they have many different types of, you know, exaggeration, so different religions. Of course, their origin is the Taku. This is what. Yeah, just now mentioned. So, thank you.
any last question? No? So I think uh, that's all to conclude our session. Uh, once again, Jazakumullah uh, khairan. And uh, I think we appreciate uh, the discussion and the, the time uh, that you devoted uh, for this session. Um, and also, I think all of us, uh, we can uh, observe the, how multifaceted this uh, discussion. It goes to tafsir, to hadith, to mitot, to dawah. And uh, I think with the, uh, the last questions, it may bring us, lead us to, to think of, we, I mean, we would be interested to know what is the position of the contemporary Jewish and Christian stance on evolution. I believe they have the debate as well on, on that subject. Uh, so it is uh, and, uh, definitely uh, an elaborate and very long uh, discussion on the subject. Uh, but we really uh, we are really grateful to have our speaker here with us and uh, to share his insight, uh, his dedicated uh, effort in the subject. I believe you know, one who dedicates his time to the subject will have a different perspective or sometimes a unique perspective sort of discovery. So uh, I think uh, it is, uh, we should uh, get the book eh? and uh, it's read the book. Uh, in Malaysia, I think uh, the distributor is Little Zihin. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Little Zihin, you can get it from Little Zihin. Uh, the book of Provenance of Adam, maybe we can uh, go deeper into the discussion and uh, have, have some correspondences with the uh, author. And, and uh, if you have comments and feedbacks, I think he will welcome any sort of feedbacks and to improve and to further uh, advance uh, the subject. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending uh, and uh, for your time this evening. I think uh, before we do it, uh, there is a presentation of token of appreciation from the side of the Pulia. Uh, so uh, the dean will be represented by our very own Dr. Mohidin. Uh, so please uh, welcome uh, Mr. Tahsin. Thank you, everyone, for attending. So, with that, we conclude our session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope to see you again in our coming sessions. Uh, Inshallah.